if you want to give me just a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. All right, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Dave Oberg, Executive Director of the Elmer's History Museum, and I'm really thrilled to join you today from our galleries. Um, in just a couple of minutes, I'm going to hand the mic over to Dan Bartlett, who's our curator of exhibits, and it's a heck of a lot more entertaining than me, I think you'll agree. Um, he's gonna give you a look at To the Moon, Snoopy Soars with NASA. This is a limited engagement uh, exhibit on loan from the Charles M. Schultz Museum, uh, running here at the uh, museum through uh, August 29th. Uh, before I hand the mic over, though, I want to say just a few words of thanks to our sponsors and the individuals and organizations that help make this uh, possible and talk about a couple of follow-up programs you might enjoy that are available online as well. Uh, first and foremost, I, I have to say a big thanks to our friends at the Charles M. Schultz Museum uh, for the loan of the wonderful exhibit. This is the third collaboration we've had with them. Every one of them has been just a great learning experience for us and a terrific collaboration. I um, want to say a very special thanks to our sponsors, our 2021 Platinum sponsor, Feezy Roofing, celebrating over 40 years here in Elmhurst, our lead sponsors for the exhibit, Lakeside Bank, Christopher B. Burke Engineering, Suburban Bank and Trust, a Wind Trust Community Bank, Itasca Bank and Trust, and John Nolden Guaranteed Rate, our Silver, silver Level sponsors, Community Bank of Elmhurst, and Storino, Ramella, and Durkin, our Bronze Level sponsor, Michael V. LaCicero, Attorney at Law, and our friend level sponsor, Ken Bartels Consulting. Uh, also wanna take a very special opportunity to thank the individuals and organizations that loan talent and material for the show. Uh, they include our intern with Talent on Loan from Elmhurst University, Angelina Tsikopoulos, our exhibits volunteer who always lends a hand with staging and mount making, Jeff Grant, and for the loan of additional items and artifacts, our friends at the Cernan Earth and Space Center, Mike Himmis, Michael Cicero, and Martha Van Geem and really does take a community, community to put these together. I want to have uh, just give a quick shout out to a couple of follow-up programs that you might enjoy as well in support of To the Moon, Snoopy Soars with NASA. Uh, you can join us uh, June 13th through July 13th for an online lecture about the space race featuring Michelle Nichols, Director of Public Observing at the Adler Planetarium. We're hosting three Museum Maker Monday programs on June 14th, July 12th, and August 9th, featuring space-themed activity kits for kids and a chance to tour the museums uh, um, on a rare Monday when we are open. Uh, while the universe is unlimited, space is limited at the museum, so I'm gonna encourage you to please RSVP in advance for that one. Um, you don't have to write all these down, I'm gonna steer you to the website at the end. Uh, July 17th at 1.30 or three o'clock, we have our Lunar Cartooners Workshop featuring Mark Anderson of Andertoons. Again, this one space is limited, so I would encourage you to RSVP. And then July 22nd through August 29th, join us for an online lecture, Apollo 10 Dress Rehearsal for the Moon with Rob Gibson. Saturday, August 7th, we're gonna be hosting a special concert to the moon, the music of Vince Guaraldi, uh, featuring jazz musicians Chris White and Sean Jacoby with sets at 1 and 2.15 on the museum grounds. And Thursday, August 19th at 6.30, join us for an online book discussion of Ellen Hildebrand's wonderful Summer of 69 in partnership with the Elmhurst Public Library. Um, also, be sure to download our app. We have an Elmhurst History Museum app. We have a family-friendly activity guide in that app. If you want to tour uh, to the moon, Snoopy Soars with NASA, you'll have some fun things to do with the family. We also have a couple of great historic walking tours um, uh, through, uh, throughout downtown Elmhurst as well available there. And finally, do mark your calendars September 18th for the return of the sixth annual Craft Beer Fest on our grounds. This is the Elmhurst Heritage Foundation's annual fundraiser to support the Elmhurst History Museum with over 100 craft beers, ciders, and hard seltzers available on our grounds. Uh, do visit our website at elmhursthistory.org for more information about all of these. And I do encourage you uh, to save any questions you have again uh, for the chat at the end. Dan and I will be back to answer those questions. Uh, so do enjoy. And we are gonna spend just a couple minutes after Dan takes us through the gallery to just hit a couple of highlights of our award-winning exhibit by all accounts, which is on the second floor of the museum as well. But without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over now to Dan Bartlett, our curator of exhibits. Enjoy. Thank you, Dave. Allow me to struggle a little bit to get this thing on. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, as Dave mentioned, I'm Dan Bartlett. I'm the curator of exhibits here at Elmhurst History Museum, and I am very happy that you've decided to spend part of your day um, with us here virtually in Elmhurst um, with the hope that uh, you can come and see us sometime soon as COVID restrictions and 
uh, ease and life begins to return to normal. So I wanna spend a little bit of time taking you through the bio, uh, the, uh, to the moon, Snoopy stores with NASA. Now, some of you probably are aware that Snoopy has actually been an astronaut since 1968. Um, and that is uh, really the, the crux of this exhibit is the ways in which NASA and Snoopy have intersected, how Snoopy became an astronaut and what his role has been at NASA over the years. And I'll get to that in a little bit, but I wanted to start with just a little bit of background into the space program in the United States in the 19, late 50s and the 1960s, because it kind of sets the stage um, for Snoopy's involvement. Um, the Cold War, the post-World War II Cold War, moved into space in 1957 when the former Soviet Union launched the first artificial satellite Sputnik into orbit around the Earth and followed that up just a couple, a uh, little while later uh, when they sent the heroic astronaut dog Laika into orbit and Laika became the first um, living creature uh, to travel in space. In 1961, the Soviets launched the first human into orbit. Um, the United States followed that up uh, just three weeks later, uh, and so the space race was off and running. Now, President John F. Kennedy understood the, the benefits in turn, the strategic benefits and, and the benefits that would accrue in regards to international prestige to whatever country could master um, space travel and, and, and space exploration first. And so in 1961, he challenged the country to put a man on the moon before the end of the 1960s. So by 19, end of 1969, President Kennedy was hoping that the United States could beat the Soviets and place um, people on the moon. Now, there were three programs that uh, NASA had running um, concurrently for the most part, um, beginning with the Mercury program, which concluded in 1963 with the successful orbit, uh, John Glenn's three successful orbits around the Earth, um, and what Mercury uh, showed us was how to put people into orbit around the Earth and bring them home safely. Uh, that turns out to be the easy part, right? Um, the second program is a Project Gemini running from 1961 to 1966. Project Gemini used uh, where Mercury had a single astronaut. Uh, Project Gemini had uh, capsules big enough for two astronauts. There were two uncrewed and 10 crewed missions for Project Gemini. Gemini was designed to test out systems um, and procedures for things like um, spacewalking, uh, extravehicular activities, which are so common among on the International Space Station today, uh, had never been done before. They were to test things like orbital rendezvous and docking of two spacecraft. Again, something reasonably common today, never been done before. Um, they were uh, practicing uh, using brand new technology. Uh, for example, fuel cells instead of batteries. Um, they, were, they employed radar um, in space on space vehicles. And Project Gemini spacecraft were the first to use onboard flight computers. You know, this things that we can bring you uh, Zoom presentations remotely um, with a, with a, a cell phone uh, that we take such a uh, take for so much for, for granted were new technology that was used uh, in Project Gemini for the first time. Um, concurrent with Gemini was the Apollo project and Apollo ran from 1961 to 1972. And Apollo's ultimate goal was to, to put uh, people on the moon and it um, achieved that goal in 1969, in the summer of 1969, um, when the first moon landing was successfully completed. Now, one of the biggest challenges for the Apollo program was coming up with the system that would deliver these brand new three-person spacecraft into orbit. And a big part of the Apollo program was perfecting the massive Saturn V um, launch vehicle that was used successfully to put, um, to put these uh, missions into space. And at 363 feet tall, um, the Saturn V remains the tallest, heaviest, and most powerful uh, rocket ever to be used. Um, and you can see the scale of this thing here with the tiny little figures down below. And to put this in perspective, 363 feet tall is only about 50 feet shorter 
than the Oak Brook Terrace Tower that many people in the western suburbs uh, see on the skyline. So uh, almost as big as the Oak Brook Terrace Tower. Um, now the Apollo program suffered uh, a, a very serious setback in 1967. In that year, three astronauts were killed in an accident while they were testing a Saturn V um, launch vehicle and the Apollo spacecraft. They were, they were fueling it on the, uh, testing it on the launch pad. There was a fire and three astronauts lost their lives. Now in the wake of that accident, uh, a request went out to employees of NASA to come up with some kind of a program that would help um, forge connections to and responsibility for the space program amongst the many thousands of people across the country that were working either for NASA or for NASA subcontractors, but were often far, far removed from the uh, space agencies um, hubs of activity at, at the space stations in Texas and Florida. And so um, Al, a gentleman named Al Chop, who was at the time NASA deputy of uh, public affairs, was a big fan of the Peanuts comic strip. So Charles Schultz's uh, iconic Peanuts characters at this time, 1967-68, were seen and loved by millions of people, uh, including Al Chop, who was a big fan of uh, Charlie Brown's uh, lovable dog, Snoopy. And Chop uh, thought that perhaps using the cartoon character Snoopy might be a way to help people feel connected to the space program. And after some um, uh, negotiations with United Features Syndicate that are detailed in an, an, uh, an audio or a video clip, I'm sorry, of Al Chop that you can see in the exhibit, um, a deal was struck with United Features Syndicate that would allow um, the space agency to use Snoopy as a character. Now, Charles Schultz thought this was a great idea. And he uh, produced um, cartoons of, of Snoopy as an astronaut, including this one. This is a reproduction of his very first drawing of uh, Snoopy as an astronaut. And what the space agency did, taking Chop's idea, was to create uh, the Silver Snoopy Award. And we've got one of those little pins right here. They're a very tiny little pin, about a half an inch um, tall. And you can see that it's based on this original cartoon that Schultz drew. And the Silver Snoopy Award is still given today to employees and subcontractors of NASA who make significant contributions to the, to the space program by developing new technology or improving old technology or saving costs or increasing safety or, or there are other categories. Um, very, very few people are awarded this on an annual basis. The pins that are given are always, have always been flown in space. They're always awarded at a special ceremony by an astronaut. And so the, the um, Silver Snoopy Award is that first connection between NASA uh, and, and, and Snoopy and, and the Peanuts gang. Uh, and it is in the wake of that terrible tragedy um, during the Apollo program. Now, Schultz went on to draw a lot of different safety related cartoons um, for NASA. And we'll take a, a look at a few of those here. All of the work he did for the space agency, he did at no cost uh, to the government, um, but a number of different safety posters were created over the years. And in March of 1969, he published, Schultz published a six panel, um, a six day long series of uh, comic strips in which Snoopy actually does land on the surface of the moon. And this was done very shortly before the Apollo 10 dress rehearsal mission for the moon, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and only what, six months, five months, prior to the uh, officially scheduled moon landings in the summer. Um, but here we have uh, reproductions of those strips of Snoopy flying his, uh, what is a sop with camel in many times uh, in his mind, becoming his spacecraft, uh, landing on the moon, um, celebrating the fact that he's the first beagle on the moon and has beaten the Russians uh, and then returning, uh, returning to earth. In 
And you really get a, a good idea of what Chop was after by uh, trying to get Snoopy involved. I mean, he was and remains for many, many people uh, an absolute favorite uh, comic character. Um, I think at the time in the 60s, he was seen by hundreds of millions of people in perhaps 75 countries around the, around the globe at that time. So very, very recognizable character. And Schultz continued to create graphics for NASA. Um, to this day, NASA uh, retains the exclusive use of Snoopy the astronaut as a character, um, but continued to produce uh, safety posters for the space agency and its contractors um, through the subsequent space shuttle programs, the International Space Station. Uh, the, as I mentioned before, the Silver Snoopy Award is still given um, and is still um, very much coveted by people that work um, in the space program. So one uh, other thing, we'll kind of take a little stroll this direction. Um, one of the fun things in the exhibit is that there are a number of period photographs from space flights in the 60s that, uh, in which you can find Snoopy and Charlie Brown because the popularity of the Silver Snoopy Award program, um, plus the, the link to the Apollo 10 program, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, the, so the exhibit includes um, examples of some of the, the earliest uh, dolls that were available of Charlie and Brown and, and uh, Snoopy, but then also allows us to find them in some uh, photographs from the exhibit on consoles, particularly at uh, Mission Control in Houston. So just kind of a fun look at how integrated um, Snoopy became in the thinking uh, in the daily life of the space agency. Now, I mentioned Apollo 10, um, and Apollo 10 is the second nexus between uh, Snoopy and the space agency. The Silver Snoopy Award um, become very, became becoming at this time very popular in NASA, the safety program, um, it's traditional for uh, space crews to choose the call signs of their spacecraft. And um, astronaut Eugene Cernan, who was on Apollo 10, um, said that he thought perhaps if they named their spacecraft um, Snoopy and Charlie Brown, that that would do one of two things. First of all, it would add a little bit more pizzazz to the Silver Snoopy Award. But also one of the, his, in his mind, um, the Apollo 10 mission did everything but land on the moon. They took the spacecraft up, they docked um, with the lunar module, they separated, they flew the lunar module within 50,000 miles of the moon's surface and they were snooping around, according to Cernan, um, at potential landing sites for the subsequent Apollo 11 mission to follow on two months later. So between the Silver Snoopy Award uh, and Gene Cernan uh, feeling like their mission was really to go snoop around the moon, Snoopy became a logical call sign to use for the lunar module and Charlie Brown, of course, uh, then became the call sign for the command module. And those were uh, added a certain of a popular appeal again to this mission um, because of its association with Charlie Brown um, and Snoopy. Now the exhibit contains um, a lot of examples of Snoopy as an astronaut. We'll see those in just a second. We've got a little theater area um, where visitors can choose from seven uh, short video clips related to the Apollo 10 mission and the involvement of Snoopy in that mission. Um, a number of examples of the Snoopy as astronaut character. Many of these, uh, if they don't date to the 50s, um, and most of these, to be honest, do not, but are based on those early um, characters, a lot of attention came back to Snoopy as an astronaut, of course, with the 50th anniversary of the moon landings beginning on the Apollo 10 mission and the moon, and, and the moon landings in 2018, 2019. Um, the number of different ways Snoopy has been dressed for his missions to the moon, uh, into space is certainly um, uh, fun to look at. And as the space agencies um, Suits have changed from white uh, with the bubbly helmets down to more uh, the more familiar, more current orange. Uh, Snoopy's changed right along with them. 
Um, and I would be remiss in uh, not telling you that we have many examples of Snoopy as astronaut for sale in the museum store. Um, and that is in fact, big hint. So uh, you can go to the moon with Snoopy and have your picture taken on the surface of the moon with Snoopy. Hey Snoop, how you doing? Now, we also included some information about local connections to the space program, particularly the Apollo program, um, because there are a lot of important connections between the Western suburbs um, and the space program. And we've selected four, not, to, not because these are the most important four. There are actually um, dozens and dozens of individuals from Chicago, the Chicagoland area that have been uh, former participants or actively working in the space program as astronauts, engineers, um, or people, you know, with, with jobs related to working with the space industry. But we'll start with Joliet's John Hubolt. Um, and Hubolt is responsible for the whole idea of creating a separate lunar module that would detach from the main spacecraft and go down to the surface of the moon um, and then bring those two astronauts back up. Um, there were in the early 60s, late 50s, some competing plans and ideas for how that would happen. And Hubolt was convinced that this system was the most economical one um, because the, the rocket and the, the logistics necessary to lift a ship big enough to go to the moon, land on the moon by itself and come back were enormous. This would reduce weight. Um, it would be able to use existing rocket technology to make it happen. The critics were, would say that, well, the problem was uh, if the two astronauts in the lunar module were unable to reconnect with the command module, there was nothing you could do. You would lose two astronauts. But the risks of that particular system were outweighed by the benefits. Um, and Hubolt um, from nearby Joliet is really responsible for, um, you know, this picture happening here, the uh, pushing and advocating for this notion of what he refers to as lunar orbit rendezvous as the technique um, by which we would land people on the moon. If we come around the corner, uh, I'll introduce you to Elmhurst's own uh, Jack Garman. Um, Jack Garman graduated from York High School here in Elmhurst in 1962 uh, and from the University of Michigan in 1966. And he helped to program the Apollo guidance computer, so the flight computers that helped guide the lunar module and the command module um, into orbit around the moon, the docking and, and things of that kind. Um, and during the Apollo 11 flight, just minutes before the astronauts were to land on the surface of the moon, they started getting a code, an error code from the flight computer, a 1202 alarm. And uh, one of Garmin's responsibilities was to create a list of every possible alarm that the system could spit out because in practice, um, there had been, uh, in simulations, they had aborted the mission when some of these unknown codes had popped up. Uh, and so young 25 year old Elmhursty and Jack Garman sitting in mission control with his list was able to very quickly inform mission controllers that the 1202 alarm and the subsequent 1201 alarms were not to, you know, not something that they had to abort the mission for. Uh, and so the ability, his ability to understand what these codes meant and quickly act on them to provide the information that flight controllers needed you know, really means that there was not an unnecessary abort of the Apollo 11 mission and that first landing on the moon could go forward. Astronaut Eugene Cernan um, graduated from uh, May, uh, Proviso East High School in 1952. So just east of us here in Elmhurst. And of course, Gene Cernan uh, has the distinction of uh, piloting the lunar module on the Apollo 10 mission of naming the, the lunar module, you know, giving it the, the, the call sign Snoopy. Um, but Cernan is also uh, known as the last man to set foot on the moon, on the Apollo 17 mission. Um, he was uh, 
uh, on that mission, as many of the astronauts were on multiple missions across the Gemini and Apollo program. And while he was not among the first on the Apollo 11 mission to set foot on the moon, he was in fact uh, the last person to um, have stood there. Born in Chicago, but grew up in Bellwood and Maywood. And of course the Cernan Center at Triton College uh, is named in his honor. And finally, we'll end uh, with Chicago's Dr. Mae Jemison, uh, who, uh, as we say in the headline here, blasted through the glass ceiling, became the first woman of color um, in space when she uh, served on a, a mission, a space shuttle Endeavor mission um, in 1992. And as I mentioned, you know, there are a lot of folks uh, in the Chicagoland area that have been involved in the space program. Um, they're easy to find lists and various places on the internet, and it's kind of fun to see who these people are. Um, Mae Jemison also uh, holds the distinction of being the first real live astronaut to appear on a Star Trek episode. And she was inspired, she says, as a little girl, among other uh, inspirations. She credits uh, Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant Uhura in the original Star Trek series, as helping uh, fuel her interests in science and space. Now, I mentioned the Cernan Center at Triton College, um, and I wanted to highlight a couple of interesting things that they loaned us for this exhibit, and I'd like to give them a, a real hearty shout out um, for their willingness to loan us some things for the exhibit. Um, but there's a couple things in this case that I find very interesting. Now, I was born in 1962, so when the moon landings were taking place, I was seven years old. Um, in a certain sense, uh, space travel, spending time in space uh, is has become kind of commonplace. Um, but back in the day, you know, my parents got me out of bed in the middle of the night to see the first grainy TV footage from the moon. And I'm sure there's others in my uh, age category that have similar stories. But we played with um, Apollo toys. We had toy Saturn V rockets and we had action figures of astronauts. And when we got done playing with those, we went into the kitchen and we had glasses of Tang and we ate space food sticks and other, you know, spacey themed things at the time. And we collected things like this um, Apollo moon flights globe that you can see here. And this little globe was just a collectible that marked, it was a, a globe of the moon, but it marked the landing sites on the moon of all of the planned Apollo landings. So there were, uh, what Apollo 11 to Apollo uh, 20 were the originally um, planned landings. And of course, the last three were unfortunately canceled, but those are, are placed on this globe as well. Um, but those kinds of little uh, collectibles, very, very common. Um, and then one of the most interesting things that, that they loaned us is this can of moon soup. Now, moon soup was uh, a favorite of, it wasn't called moon soup at the at the time, but it was a favorite of astronaut James Irwin. And he requested that the space agency put it in the rotation of um, the menu of the Apollo 15 mission. Um, and the restaurant that created the soup gladly provided the recipe to NASA who produced it in such a form that it could be taken on Apollo 15 and subsequent flights. Um, and later went on in this form, this kind of canned condensed form um, to be sold at the, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum for several years. You could buy a can of moon soup when you went to visit the uh, retired aircraft and spacecraft at the Smithsonian. But I wanted to finish with perhaps the most unique artifact in the exhibit, which is this photograph of the moon that has been signed by all um, 17 of the astronauts that have walked on it. So in one place here, we have uh, a really nice, interesting, um, very powerful record of our, the, the accomplishments of the Apollo program of those, uh, the Gemini program, the Mercury program, the space race um, culminating uh, in landing, you know, these very heroic uh, people on the surface of the moon. And it's certainly my hope and many others, I think, to maybe we can add to this list in the not too distant future. 
um, that we can find uh, good reasons to return uh, to the moon, utilize some of the uh, information we've learned in programs with the International Space Station and exploration of Mars to return to the moon and hopefully to Mars uh, and beyond. So. So as Dave mentioned, the exhibit runs through uh, October, or October, I'm sorry. The exhibit runs through August 29th. There is a very robust um, selection of programs and lectures and events, concerts that you can come. So come and see the exhibit, um, spend some time uh, with some of these programs. You can learn all the details at our website, elmhursthistory.org. Um, but at this point, I'm gonna turn this back to David. He's gonna take you upstairs to take a very brief look at some highlights from our by all account exhibits. And then I'll join him in a few minutes. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them then. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, I wanted to take just a, a moment to uh, take us upstairs and just show a couple of my favorite things in our award winning exhibit uh, by all accounts. Um, there's way too much for us to cover um, in an afternoon like this, but I want to at least tease you and give you a reason to come see us. Um, I also, before we go upstairs, uh, want to give a special shout out. Uh, Dan um, always does a little extra to make this accessible to as many people as possible and as fun for people as possible. And so on our North Lawn, we actually have a train like an astronaut activity station as well. So for um, any young uh, patrons or the young at heart, uh, you can uh, uh, go through four exercises to train for life in zero G. I know there's a future astronaut out there somewhere. Um, and then actually we're going to uh, include an outdoor exhibit uh, opening July 1st as well on loan from the Smithsonian Institution's traveling exhibit system. It's a poster exhibit um, on uh, called Mission Moon um, on the actual um, uh, race to, to reach the moon as well. So lots to see. We're going to head upstairs now, um, and I want to give a special shout out to Caitlin Thurnall, who is our director of cinematography today. Uh, she's behind the camera and doing a great job. And we're going to head up the stairs. If you've never been to visit us before, we are situated in an historic home. Uh, it's actually a Queen Anne home with uh, Romanesque uh, revival architecture and belonged to uh, the first president of the village of Elmhurst, uh, Henry Gloss and his wife, Lucy. Um, they uh, led the charge to incorporate the village in 1882 and eventually built this grand home that houses the museum today. I'm gonna introduce you to Henry and Lucy right there. Uh, they're very civic minded individuals. They did not have children. And so they actually willed this home uh, to be used for public purposes by the community of Elmhurst. It served during World War II uh, as a ration book office. And then uh, after World War II became our city hall, the Elmhurst History Museum itself grew up uh, on the third floor of city hall. And eventually when this building became, began to be too small for city hall, we took over the entirety of it. And now we actually run three sites, our adjacent education center next door and also the Churchville one room schoolhouse. So lots to see and do when you come to visit us in Elmhurst. And by the way, I know we have a lot of folks from the Chicagoland area here. Um, we are just a quick metro ride away. As a matter of fact, the, if you get off at the Elmhurst stop, the museum is only two blocks from the stop. So I hope you will come see us. Uh, I'm gonna give you just a couple highlights. There we go. Of our award-winning exhibit by all accounts, which gives you a thumbnail history of Elmhurst from its foundation to the present. Uh, and the first piece I want to call out is this trunk. Uh, this belonged to Henrietta uh, Maisenbrink, who was a very early German immigrant to Addison Township before there even was a community of Elmhurst in 1838. And she would marry John Fisher, uh, the Fisher family, a very early farming family in this area in 1843. And uh, as a matter of fact, the Fisher family donated the land uh, where eventually in 1850, we built the Churchville One Room Schoolhouse, now on the National Register of Historic Places and one of the sites that the Elmhurst History Museum operates actually. And this trunk to me as an historian just fills my mind with imagination. I, I, when I look at something like this, I can't help but think about those difficult choices. What am I going to bring with me to the new world? What is going to be left behind? 
What is a treasure worthy of taking over with me with this limited space? Where is this place I'm going to exactly? Uh, and uh, again, it's just something that, that absolutely uh, uh, engages my imagination. Um, just give you a little background on the history of the community itself as well. Uh, like a lot of areas in northern Illinois, uh, the area that became Elmhurst was settled largely after the Treaty of Chicago in 1833. We began to see early farm families here uh, emerging in the 1830s. And then uh, this gentleman here, Jerry Bates, um, actually helped to put us on the map. Uh, he created the Hill Cottage Tavern, uh, sited at the intersection of what is now Cottage Hill Avenue and St. Charles Road. St. Charles Road, believe it or not, was a very early wagon trail which connected the growing community of Chicago with the Fox River Valley. He established a post office there, uh, had a tavern there as well where you could take on water and supplies. And uh, eventually he's going to enter into an agreement with the railroad. And we're gonna head over in this direction and negotiates with the Galena and Chicago Railroad on a right of way that comes through Elmhurst. July 4th of 1849, the locomotive pioneer pulls the first train through Elmhurst and because Jerry Bates donates land to create a freight and passenger depot, we are stitched very early into a train line that connects Chicago with all of the suburbs to the west of us. And this really does put us on the map. Uh, we have a few uh, photos of some grand homes here. Beginning in the late 1850s and in the 1860s and 70s, we see a lot of well-to-do uh, Chicago business people who decide it might be a nice idea to build a grand estate in Elmhurst and I can catch the train and go right to the city. We became basically a suburban community uh, by the 1860s and 70s with people commuting by a train into the city to make their livelihood. That's going to really, um, well, how do I want to say this? That's going to really, really accelerate it after the turn of the century with the arrival of another rail line, and that is the um, Chicago, Aurora, and Elgin light rail system, which runs a line through here and establishes two uh, uh, passenger uh, stations just south of the Elmhurst community limits, about a half mile south at York and Villette and the second one on Spring Road. Well, it doesn't take very long for the community of Elmers to annex those properties. And this really accelerates the community's growth. Between 1902, when that rail line first comes out here, and 1930, our community triples in size as far as the footprint of the community, but those grand estates become subdivided and become little suburban neighborhoods. And we grow by a factor of 7.5 times in that period of time. It's only the Great Depression that stops that accelerated growth. And after the post-war period, again, it's a boom once again. Um, I gotta call out two other favorite items here um, in the collection. And then I have to show one last, what I think is maybe the neatest thing I've ever seen in a museum. I encourage you to come and try it out. Uh, first and foremost, one of our more notable residents here in Elmhurst was Carl Sandberg who moves here with his family in 1919. By then, he's already becoming a well-established poet, uh, but he's still working several day jobs. He's a movie critic. Uh, he's writing for a Chicago labor uh, newspaper at this time. And Elmhurst is a perfect community for him. Uh, it's sited on the rail line, so he can take the train into the city. And we have his typewriter actually in the collection. Uh, his family lives here from 1919 until 1928. Uh, this typewriter helped to write a number of very important uh, Sandberg pieces, including Lincoln, the Prairie Years. Several volumes of poetry are written while he lives here at Elmhurst. Uh, this is also when he collects the Great American Song Bag, uh, dabbling in his interest in folk music, and also writes the Rutabaga stories, uh, his famous uh, children's uh, stories as well. Uh, prolific years for uh, Sandberg, and I just think it's, it's one of the really neat items we have in the collection. Um, and in addition to that, we're actually very lucky that we have film footage of he and his family and his daughters actually playing in the yard uh, when they lived here in Elmhurst, which I never know how video to video translates, but you can see one of the girls on the swing in the backyard right there. I just think that's magic. Uh, it's why we come to museums. It's to see the real deal, the thing that was really there. Uh, for those of you not, uh, not inclined to poetry, um, or history, 
uh, or children's stories. Um, I'll give you uh, another uh, item of interest here related to an Elmhurst sports icon. We have a trophy belonging to an original uh, footage and images belonging to Fred Lorenzen. Uh, Fred Lorenzen is a local resident, um, one of the first northerners to really break into the largely southern sport of NASCAR in the 1960s. Uh, his nicknames included uh, the Elmhurst Express, uh, the Golden Boy, and Fearless Freddy. His race to win uh, ratio is almost unparalleled. Uh, he was a terrific uh, race car driver uh, back in the 60s, and early 70s. And we even have a photograph. I just love this. Um, he was a racer early on. This is his uh, soapbox uh, derby car even. Uh, you can't beat that. That's as good as it gets. Um, so a great story for you to enjoy uh, if you come here to visit us in Elmhurst. And the last thing I'm going to show you is uh, our interactive map. And this is proprietary technology developed for us here at the museum. Uh, it is among the neatest things that I have ever seen in my career, I have to say. I'm gonna put this into teaching mode right now, and I'm just gonna show you how it works. And uh, I think you're, you'll enjoy it. And as we're getting back to a time uh, when slowly, as COVID is receding, we're getting new guidance from the CDC on how to use interactive exhibits in our, uh, our, um, our different museums, we're able to bring these things back online. So you're seeing an aerial view of modern Elmhurst. This really hasn't changed at all in the last decade. I'm going to dial this back to 1860 when we're becoming a suburban community and we're beginning to see a few grand estates here. And you can see the entirety of Elmhurst, which you can walk end to end in less than 15 minutes. Although you'll see in the middle of the map, we already have our train line, our rail line, which has helped to put us on the map. Things are going to change dramatically. I'm just gonna show you a couple of bells and whistles um, on the map here. As we head into, let's go to about 1910. This is again, when the Chicago Roar and Elgin rail line has really helped to accelerate the growth of South Elmhurst. And if we dial up to 1930, when that growth kind of stops because of the Great Depression, you'll see the community has really exploded in size at this point, uh, particularly to the south near that Chicago Roar and Elgin uh, light rail line. By the way, that train line very famously went bankrupt July 3rd of 1957. The CA and E, Chicago Roar and Elgin, did not do a very good job of telling people that they were going to discontinue service. And you can still talk to a few people of a certain generation who were stranded downtown right before 4th of July and had to take a taxi or a bus home. Um, our, the last thing you might notice is there's a lone little uh, icon that looks like an airplane way up in this undeveloped farmland to the north. Uh, we had our own airport here at Elmhurst until the lease uh, was failed to be renewed in 1956. It goes out of business in 1957. And between 57 and the early 60s, uh, we see that land redeveloped. And again, Elmhurst explodes in size. And honestly, other than a couple of little neighborhoods that get infilled here and there, uh, that's pretty much the modern footprint of our community to this very day. So I encourage you to come soon, play with the map, and learn a little more about the history of the community. Um, at this point, I think we can open up the chat to any questions that we might have. And uh, I'm gonna encourage uh, uh, Dan Bartlett to join me as well. And uh, he's more interesting than I am. You probably have more questions for him than you do me, but I really appreciate the opportunity to show off a little bit. Encourage you to please, please do come and visit us. And again, visit us on elmhursthistory.org for a listing of our programs, upcoming exhibits and programs, and so, so, so much more. Thank you guys very, very much. Um, that was an awesome presentation. What was in the moon soup and what kind of soup was it? It was a vegetable soup um, that was a puree from what I understand. And it had a lot of uh, green vegetables in it. So I think like spinach and parsley and things of that kind. So um, I didn't open, of course, haven't opened a can to see it. Uh, but as I understand, one of the reasons that um, NASA thought it was a good fit for the space program was, was <clears throat> very nutritious in the sense that it was very much a vegetable based soup. This is another thing you can, um, you can find more information about online, including, I believe, the recipe for it if you want to try to make it yourself. Does NASA still have any agreements slash connections with soup in China? 
Does NASA have any uh, continuing agreements with um, NASA and or Charlie Brown? Yes. Um, the space agency still has the exclusive uh, right to the um, Snoopy the astronaut character. Um, and clearly that is licensable uh, to others um, based on the number of, of figures and dolls that are available. Um, and then the Silver Snoopy Award is still presented annually again to that small fraction of, of, of employees or contractors that have made significant contributions to the space program. Um, so yeah, that, that relationship continues uh, and it'll be exciting to see if Snoopy eventually goes to Mars. It'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. but what? Um, we have a question, how are they associated Sure. The association, um, why, how, how did the, the Snoopy um, uh, NASA Association come into play? The, the first way was really through that Silver Snoopy Award that was created in the wake of that Apollo, um, what they call Apollo 1 accident in 1967, um, as a way to foster that connection to and responsibility for um, the space program amongst the many, many thousands of people across the country. Um, so as a safety mascot, essentially for NASA in the wake of that of that um, of that tragedy. Why did, they choose? Why did they choose Snoopy? Well, again, um, Snoopy was incredibly popular at the time, um, as he is it remains today. So um, United Feature Syndicate was syndicating the Peanuts comic strip to something like seventy-five different countries. You know, and tens and millions of people in the United States were probably seeing it in their daily and and. and um, weekend papers. And so Al Chop, the, the director of public affairs at NASA, really felt that this very recognizable character um, would be a good way to help people connect to the space program in a very personal way, um, to really make the space program um, and the underlying goals of, um, of safety within that program um, more accessible, you know, because when we see Snoopy get on his um, doghouse and fly to the moon, it puts things into a little bit different perspective than you might have seen Walter Cron Cronkite reporting on the 530 News, you know, so just to make it fun um, and recognizable. Some question for you, how does the moon shine light? How does the moon shine light? <laughs> this is a trick question. Um, I believe it reflects it from someplace else, presumably the sun. <laughs> This is a stump the curator. Does anybody else want to stump the curator? It's probably pretty easy to do. Um, do we have replicas for sale of the moon picture with the astronaut's We do not. Oh, uh, the question is, do we have replicas for sale of the moon picture with the astronaut signatures? Um, and we do not. Um, I'm not sure that the Cernan Center does either, um, but if you're interested in that, um, please contact um, the folks at the, the Cernan Center at Triton College. I wish we did. It's a really cool piece. Do you have any Apollo 11 memorabilia? Hmm. Do either of us have Apollo 11 memorabilia from our childhood? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't have much. Um, I was a baby. I'm just a couple years younger than Dan, actually. Um, but we had uh, a series of uh, molded plastic astronaut figures related to the Apollo 10, uh, or the Apollo 11 mission, rather, of uh, the moon landing. And then um, my neighbor and friend, Brett Underwood, who was a year older than me, actually had the Apollo 11 rocket, uh, which he was the envy of the entire neighborhood, I have to say, uh, for having that. And certainly our eyes were very much on the stars still um, uh, during my childhood. Yeah, and I do not, but I wish I had some of the things that I trashed long ago as a, as a child, you know, but who, who knows when you're playing with this stuff and you're nine, 10 years old that you should save it and sell it for your retirement when you get to be 58 or 59 years old. Um, is the shelter digital self-guided or can you get a guide for a small group? Is the Schultz exhibit self-guided or can you get a guide for a small group? Um, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> um, it is primarily uh, designed to be a self-guided experience. However, if you contact the museum, um, I would be happy to give a, a group tour um, for a, a special occasion or a special group. Um, how does the Amherst History Museum decide what exhibits Ooh, that's a great question. Ooh, I get that one. All right. Uh, so we really take a team's approach as we develop any of the uh, themes for exhibits, whether they're the in-house exhibits we create here 
or when we book a traveling exhibit like that. And so um, we have a, a committee uh, that includes a, a Dan, our, our curator of exhibits, Dan Lund, who is our curator of collections, Jess Wandersay, who is our supervisor of education services, uh, myself, and then Patrice Roach, who is our marketing communication specialist. And we begin working usually two to three years ahead of time, trying to outline a variety of themes that are going to appeal to different uh, interest groups, uh, different demographic groups. Uh, we like to find themes that speak both to local history and to the broader history of our region, especially because we're on the rail line. And now we also do a lot of work with stakeholders as well to kind of think about how our exhibit themes might, for example, tie to uh, during the school year, uh, local school curriculum, um, if it might connect to uh, major anniversaries or events as well. Uh, our next exhibit is going to be uh, a sesquicentennial exhibit that uh, is, is going to look at the 150th anniversary of Elmhurst University and the interplay between our community and the university that grew up here as well. Uh, Dan, I don't know if you want to follow up on that. No, I, I think you, you covered it very well. Um, we're a very small staff. Um, we all wear a lot of different hats um, and that works in our favor when we're talking about what exhibits to do. So um, again, that notion that we're talking about um, national history, regional history, um, but always with kind of a local historical lens, which is why we decided to add some local flavor um, to the Snoopy exhibit. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was close like a presentation. Sure. What are our times and what are our visitations? What are our times and I'm going to turn this back to the boss because I will screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we are open um, uh, Tuesday uh, through Friday from 1 o'clock until 5 o'clock. Saturdays, we are open 10 o'clock until 5. Sundays, again, 1 o'clock until 5. And for larger groups that want to book a group tour, uh, we can work with you before and after hours as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think sometimes that's preferable because you get a little bit of an extra uh, uh, private touch as well as part of your tour. Uh, we do invite you to come here. And again, please visit elmhursthistory.org. We got a lot of great supporting programs for this exhibit coming up. I'd uh, love to have you take advantage of those. Some of those are online and some in person as well as things return uh, a little more to normal as summer goes on. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, we have unplugged the mic so we can hear our presenters. All right, well, thank you guys very much. Um, that was, a, you guys did a fantastic job. That was, um, everybody's really appreciative and it was very um, informational. I think a lot of people are looking forward to coming out and visiting you in person. So I hope that all of you do. Um, one more thing, when we close the webinar today, you're gonna see a short survey pop up in your Zoom client. If you have a few minutes, you could please um, fill it out for us. We'd really appreciate your feedback. And I just wanna send one more thank you to the Elmhurst History Museum um, for a job well done today and for entertaining so many of us. So yeah, thank you guys so much. Everyone have a great afternoon. <laughs>